Today we're going to look at queer theory and we're going to focus in particular on the work of uh, who the man who is arguably the most influential intellectual in the academic world, at least over the past 30 or 40 years, uh, namely Michel Foucault. Uh, Foucault is uh, the centerpiece of my um, look at queer theory today, but he won't be the only figure I mention. I'll be talking about Judith Butler as well um, and, and her work, but I'm going to try and take a broader look at the uh, issues underlying uh, the, the uh, discipline of, of queer theory, uh, as it's called, um, using the terminology that's been bequeathed there. I should begin by what I say I have said over the last several years when I've taught this, which is when I began teaching literary theory, um, I did not include this as a part of the um, uh, part of the course because I didn't see it as uh, deserving any more um, priority than than other branches of um, post-humanist theories or identity group theories uh, that uh, were also. Uh, abounding at the time. So we, I, I, I'm not looking at Latino literary theory or uh, native literary theories, uh, however you want to describe them, uh, but I am going to look at uh, queer theory. Uh, the reason I've done so is largely because since I started teaching this course, the, uh, the landscape has simply changed. Uh, and now it seems to me that it would be uh, negligent, negligent of me not to uh, include queer theory as a significant aspect of literary theory uh, in order to help us understand contemporary literary theory. So let me say a bit about, uh, begin by saying a little bit about Michel Foucault. Uh, again, you can gather from the name that Foucault is uh, another French uh, theorist uh, born in uh, 1926. 26. Uh, and died in 1984. <laughs> uh, Foucault is famous for his, <coughs> his discussion of the relationship between power and knowledge and the means by which social control is exercised through uh, formulating what we call knowledge. Uh, he is often called a post-structuralist uh, and also a post-modernist Unsurprisingly, he rejects the labels. <coughs> In my experience, uh, most creative thinkers tend to uh, reject labels uh, in large part because there are aspects of their thought which they think are not captured by the labels. Uh, and uh, they don't like being lumped in uh, with others that will fall under the broad umbrella but differ from them on matters which they regard as significant. So with that said, um, I think it, it can be said that Foucault is rather um, a rebel within the ranks of <coughs> academia. Even amongst the rebels, I would say Foucault is a sort of a uh, rebellious figure uh, in the avant-garde. Uh, uh, one of his colleagues, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, uh, summarizes his thought as a long exploration of transgression going beyond social limits and even uh, always inseparably linked uh, to knowledge and uh, power. And the man who uh, wrote a little uh, short little introduction to uh, Foucault, uh, Philip Stokes from the University of Reading noticed that uh, the theme that underlies all Foucault's work is the relationship between power and knowledge and how the former uh, is always used to control and define uh, the latter. And so when we call, uh, uh, or at least we, when the authorities claim scientific knowledge, they are just exerting a sort of social control. And so Foucault shows, for instance, in the 18th century, how the term madness was used to categorize and stigmatize not just the mentally ill, <coughs> but the poor and the sick, and the homeless and, and indeed anyone whose expressions of individuality were unwelcome. 
So that is broadly uh, the uh, strokes with which I'd like to begin uh, discussion of Foucault. I think these are broadly accurate depictions. And I want to, uh, to some degree, repeat what I said last class about uh, um, post-colonial literature <coughs> when coming to discuss uh, queer theory, because I think that uh, the queer theory, like post-colonial literature, is a very mixed bag of a wide variety of influences. So the influence that Foucault himself cites as most um, important to him is the figure of uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly. Uh, Nietzsche himself was a very much of an iconoclast and a transgressive figure, and of course also wrote works um, on beyond good and evil, uh, and talked about the, um, largely probably in a self-reflexive way, spoke about the intellectual being an ubermensch, um, and I described what I meant by that, not the English translation of a superman, but rather of somebody who goes on ahead of those behind him and pulls others up by the rope, but he himself is not being led by anyone else. So he is a sort of a, uh, a figure for the explorer, which we see is uh, commonly depicted in literature, like in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the figure of the scientist uh, and of the uh, explorer himself in, in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein of Walton. And uh, this depicts in general the way in which I would say uh, thinkers in the wake of, uh, of Friedrich Hegel and uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau tend to operate. They tend to see themselves, they, mm -hmm. we would describe them as uh, modernists, progressivists, um, however you want to describe them. But in general, they are uh, talking not about uh, retaining and um, disseminating past knowledge, but rather of um, moving forward into new areas of knowledge uh, as explorers of the human spirit. And so I mentioned last time that one of the most famous chapters of Hegel's famous work, The Phenomenology of Spirit, is on the master-slave dialectic, so-called. Um, and I also mentioned that, that Marxists, although Marx himself is not included under uh, this, uh, understood the reversal of the master-slave relation as one of the central passages of the book. Uh, and... Um, and that's important because I think that uh, Foucault, like so many in the French school of philosophy in the 1960s and onwards, uh, is fairly closely, so fairly closely associated with uh, radical Marxist movements, even Maoist, in their orientation. And it's fair to say for, uh, for Hegel on his behalf, many recent Hegel scholars uh, don't uh, they disagree with this portrait that the Marxists have taken of this, and they think that it's not a commentary on social practices or historical processes. It's probably only talking about intellectual categories behind the scene. And I myself have suggested that last time that it really refers to uh, the, the uh, thesis and the antithesis and the synthesis. It's, it's talking about uh, what goes on in the mind which is uh, reflected in the social practices as well. So I think you can have it as both and, but he's not only making a sociological commentary or a historical commentary. He's, he's speaking in the same way that uh, he would have understood uh, Plato to have been speaking in the Republic. He's talking about social relations as a, my, as a macrocosm that reflects the microcosm of what's going on inside the individual. I think that's a better way of seeing what Hegel is doing. And um, <clears throat> I think that uh, to some degree that is what even Foucault is describing here. He's not merely talking about sociology or politics. Uh, practitioners will seize upon his work and want to apply it. And indeed, they do apply it, of course. But he himself would probably um, want to suggest that it's a more uh, intellectual process than that. In fact, I'm going to suggest that he does do that. 
But I want to talk about another aspect of this whole dynamic. I said at the outset that he was most interested in the issues of uh, the relationship between power and knowledge. <clears throat> and it's a famous saying of Foucault that knowledge is power. And how, the, how, how uh, power is used to control and define what knowledge is and also what it's not. And so uh, one of the things that they would say in response to um, a historic understanding of truth and falsehood is that this assertion of the boundary between truth and falsehood was simply the product of the dominant uh, group, social group, whatever it was at the time, uh, asserting what truth is uh, and giving it a social construction uh, thereby because of their political or social dominance. But it wasn't really true in the sense that it had any purchase on a reality that lay outside of the construction of those who were using the language to describe it as true or false. <clears throat> and for that reason, I think that we can see the influence of what Foucault has said that he uh, does not really acknowledge that he is falling in, uh, broadly speaking, in the post-structuralist view of language. Whether he's very interested in that or not is beside the point. Uh, his view of language is that it, it, it is evolving, it is changing, and it's to some degree infinitely malleable furthermore. And I'll use some quotations from Foucault later on to try and demonstrate <clears throat> that I'm not misrepresenting him here. But one of the issues that I want to move on with that, with the, the idea that power uh, determines knowledge, <clears throat> is one of the metaphors that uh, Foucault uses for his um, demonstration of this. And it's, it's something that uh, Jeremy Bentham, uh, the utilitarian philosopher, the English utilitarian philosopher, invented something called the panopticon prison. Uh, a panopticon prison is a prison in which uh, the, the individuals within the prison or the, the guards <clears throat> sit in the, in the center of the prison. And the, 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 design, the design is such that it allows all the prisoners of the institution to be observed by a single security guard. So he's in the center and they are around the circumference of this. So prisons will have been constructed in accordance with this. And of course, the inmates cannot know because of that whether they're being watched or not. Um, and of course, it's physically impossible for the guard to watch all the inmates cell at once, but they don't know whether they're being watched or not. And so because of that fact, they're motivated to act as though they were being watched and could be being watched at all times. And so they are effectively compelled by the fear of uh, being observed to do something illicit to regulate their own behavior. And so there is an inspection house at the center and the uh, prisoners are that. And so for the, the, the prisons, uh, often particularly in solitary confinement, um, you'll see these portrayed in films, have, have uh, solid doors, but then there's a, a slot to look into it and that sort of thing. But it's the rotunda model that is called the panopticon. And uh, it's uh, the, the, the Greek word, it's uh, derived from the Greek word for all seeing. So the English uh, social reformer, uh, Jeremy Bentham, creates this invention and it is widely adopted for the production of uh, prisons in the 19th century uh, and in the 20th century for that matter. In fact, it is still used uh, to uh, that degree, uh, to some degree rather. Um, it has uh, received considerable criticism um, in recent years. And to me, this is somewhat of off topic on the issue of queer theory, but it, I do want to talk about something that's, uh, I think, interesting related to it, and that is the perception of, of power from observation, which is demonstrated by the very construction of the panopticon prison. And uh, it has come under significant criticism namely uh, Bentham's idea of this as a way of a uh, humane treatment of the those being watched by uh, many conservatives. So there's a conservative uh, historian by the name of Shirley Letwin that uh, attributes the, uh, the Fabian progressive zeal for social planning uh, to, um, to the uh, effectively the dehumanization of the prisoners. So there's a terrific, horrible efficiency that that comes from this, 
and 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 she accuses Bentham of forgetting the dangers of unrestrained power and and says that in his zeal for reform he actually prepared the way for the very thing that he feared <clears throat> and some will even argue that Bentham's uh, calculus of pain and pleasure and utility and uh, the efficiency and and the good intentions of those who are doing the reforming have actually paved the way for totalitarian states. And I think the criticism has some validity myself. Uh, but there's a lot of discussion about this in uh, surveillance studies and, and prison studies and so forth. And so in the, in the late 1960s, a, 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 an American uh, historian, uh, another conservative by the name of uh, Gertrude Himmel Himmelfarb, um, who wrote extensively on intellectual history, published a work called The Haunted House of Jeremy Bentham, uh, which de depicted this uh, uh, panopticon and the idea of controlling what everyone's doing by watching them as a, a, a tool of oppression and social control. <clears throat> so I, I say that because the, the criticisms, criti critiques that uh, Michel Foucault is going to advance on uh, the relation of power to knowledge and therefore to seeing are not restricted to the to the political left of which Michel Foucault was a member. But I am talking about Foucault here and he uses it as a model <clears throat> or a metaphor rather for the modern disciplinary society. And he argues this, this emerges in the 18th century and this is interesting because the 18th century is not uh, a period that's marked by Christianity, it's marked by uh, uh, the Enlightenment and to some degree a reaction and a rebellion against the uh, against Christianity. And there's an attempt to rationally order uh, society in accordance with, with pure reason. And I've in many classes depicted some of the serious challenges that arise from this attempt to purify reason uh, and to uh, and chiefly in its the way it dehumanizes, uh, but he argues that it it first arises here, and then it gets applied in a variety of other disciplines. So he will say that it will be applied not only to prisons, but also to hospitals, and also to schools, and also to factories. Uh, he describes that in uh, uh, a variety of works, actually. And he, he argues that even things like public executions were eventually eliminated as a punishment uh, uh, because society believed that there was a more rational way of dealing with this. And this was through the total control of the individual within the context of a penitentiary. Now note the word penitentiary it <clears throat> suggests multiple things. One of them could be punishment and one could be simply a penalty. Um, but with the panopticon model, uh, the belief was that by being observed, people would regulate their own conduct and therefore there was a sense of rehabilitation that would come with this. Now, my understanding from um, <clears throat> conversations and studies over the years is that the prison system does nothing to actually reform people and uh, most uh, penologists or those who, who study uh, the use of prisons will argue, in fact, that prison, far from reforming people, makes them worse when they come out than they were when they went in. And so there's a great deal of critique of the modern penitentiary system as a consequence of that. Uh, and, but what Foucault observes is that this panopticon becomes a, a, a sort of a symbol of what happens throughout society. Now, really what Foucault is doing, and this is the point on which I'm going to agree with him, is he is arguing how enlightenment reasoning has a dehumanizing effect uh, through by accumulating power in the hands of, of an elite. Uh, where, I, where I disagree is that this uh, critique of the enlightenment extends further back to the whole of human history. Uh, and so to give it a sort of a Marxist take, although I, I think uh, Foucault is actually not a card carrying Marxist, it's more of a reaction against the social conditions of his day that led him uh, into that position, but he's not there doctrinally, as it were. 
uh, in a, and you can see this in part because of his emphasis on sexuality, uh, which would is more of a, of a cultural Marxist position rather than uh, historically or traditionally Marxist position. Uh, one final comment I want to make before I come to look at uh, his work and you, and the look at uh, Peter Sandlin's work, Plastic People, which I've assigned as a sort of an introduction to this, is the idea uh, that uh, this um, influence, oh, by the way, Foucault was the first uh, French public figure to die of AIDS, which I think is also interesting. So... Um, um, he has all sorts of significance in relation to queer theory uh, in connection with, with the way in which disease was handled by the establishment as well. You know, what was considered to be um, uh, an illness and what was considered to be something that was a moral judgment or a punishment or the wrath of God or whatever. That, that also, that whole dynamic there gets caught up in um, Foucault's own discussion of, of power and knowledge, <clears throat> and it still influences the debates there. But this moves on from uh, the, the discipline society that Foucault uh, described in a later writer by the name of Gilles Deleuze, who I'm not going to uh, look at in depth on this course, and he argues that uh, we are moving uh, away, and in fact, we have moved away from a, a disciplinary society to a con society of control. And so he says that the enclosures of the prison are, are molds, but the controls are a modulation. And so technology has allowed physical enclosures like schools and factories and prisons and office buildings to be replaced by a self-governing machine. Uh, and that machine is largely the internet and surveillance cameras and so forth. So the, the, the power of technology that allows <clears throat> uh, me to speak to you when you're not in the same room has the negative effect of allowing people to see through that camera and watch me and trace me. And so uh, one of the things that's come up in more recent years with social media and so forth is simply the idea that you can be traced and in fact you can be um, not just identified but you're you can be profiled in some ways by using these materials and you can be marketed to on the specifics of it and for me this is all very interesting and fascinating it brings in the issue uh, and the matter of technology into the discussion of literary theory uh, in ways that um, have transformed the discussion of what constitutes literary theory. And I haven't really said enough about that on the course, in large part because until uh, the 20th century, I don't think technology uh, is that large an issue in what we call literary theory. But given the uh, uh, intervention of technology, the medium of technology between individuals, it also forms them and also is a part of even the idea of what literature is and what uh, the dynamics of, of of reading are and understanding is it a is it a is it the printed page or is it um, the spoken word um, we already saw that Derrida had words to say about that um, but that that uh, uh, brief meditation on the importance of the panopticon and how Foucault regards it as an oppressive way of controlling and disciplining has moved in more contemporary theories uh, away from disciplining to controlling. Uh, and so that uh, idea will be even there in terms of, uh, of the use of language. So with all that, uh, let me move on to uh, the idea of plastic people, uh, written by a, a friend of mine, uh, uh, Peter Sandlin, uh, a little short little pamphlet on this, hardly um, exhaustive, but I think it's a, a helpful introduction insofar as he frames the debate, uh, writing as a Christian, uh, in terms of the idea of what queer theory says in relation to uh, our understanding of human nature. Um, so, and, and those are the broad confines that I think it's, it's useful to consider because uh, although I don't want to uh, misrepresent 
uh, Foucault's views, I think uh, in order to understand them, we, we need to have common ground uh, to critique, to determine. And I guess I'll just have to risk being accused of oppressing simply by not accepting the categories of understanding. Um, but um, it's certainly the case that I, I called it queer theory. This is the term that the theorists themselves used. When I first heard it, I, I didn't like it because I didn't want to be seen to be uh, or perceived to be making a pejorative comment, but it was used as a, uh, an emancipatory uh, claim. Uh, and so when they used the word queer, queer um, Sandlin notes that when the term has been used as a paralyzing slur, as the mundane interpolation of pathologized sexuality, you know, you're queer, uh, it has produced the, the user of the term as the emblem and the vehicle of normalization. Whereas the, uh, the occasion, this is Judith Butler's comment on queer theory, by the way, I should have cited the phrase. So when the term has been used as a paralyzing slur, as the mundane interpolation of pathologized sexuality, you know, you're not normal, it has produced the user of the term as the emblem and vehicle of normalization the occasion of its utterance as the discursive regulation of the boundaries of sexual legitimacy. So I'm legitimate using the word queer. You, the person who is queer, are thereby illegitimate. Butler goes on. Much of the straight world has always needed the queers it has sought to repudiate through the performative force of the term. And so Butler, when she uses this term, is uh, really laying hold of... Um, uh, the linguistic theories of the structuralists. So there, thereby, we talked about these in terms of a binary. So male and female, or straight and queer. And so the one has had a, a power dynamic in oppressing the other and de and stigmatizing it and delegitimizing it. <clears throat> now, uh, Sandlin notes, and I certainly uh, agree with him, that Christians ought to cultivate an empathetic understanding of the concerns and methods of these writers, writers like Butler and Foucault, uh, those that self-designate as queer or lesbian or gay thinkers. Um, and if for no other reason than that uh, our whole culture has been uh, impacted by the queer movement, um, and so have the terms of belief for that matter, but, and so whole generations and central aspects of Christian um, identity uh, don't make sense to a generation that describes itself as having been queered. And so this is one of the problems for simply engaging with our contemporaries is if the forms of discourse that we use um, are not the forms of discourse that those that self-identify as queer themselves use, then there's a problem of people talking uh, past one another. And at the same time, uh, if we want to speak truthfully and believe that there is such a thing as truth, uh, we need to understand uh, where they're coming from. <clears throat> and so I think uh, uh, attempting to be sympathetic is a small but essential part in uh, engaging with our, our culture, uh, which is by most descriptions secular. And, and now I'm quoting Charles Taylor, who says that the shift to secularity consists of a move from a society where the belief in God is unchallenged and indeed unproblematic, to one in which it is understood to just be one option among others and frequently not the easiest to embrace. I think that's what we will call understatement. Uh, since uh, Sandlin wrote this and uh, since Taylor wrote the, uh, his uh, work on a secular age in 2007, I think that it's fair to say that the landscape uh, and the attitude towards Christians has become in, uh, increasingly less uh, uh, warm in the public square. Uh, we can see uh, Christians themselves becoming anathematized uh, in accordance with the growth and the power of those who are controlling the discourse. So <clears throat> on to Foucault. Um, Foucault is, uh, unlike many of his contemporaries uh, and the French theorists that we have looked at, uh, fairly lucid and fairly witty and uh, enjoyable, I would say. And this is one of the reasons that he uh, 
he gained in such popularity and in such um, not just pop, uh, popular popularity, but amongst the academic world uh, grew in importance is not just because his observation about power and its influence in the formation of knowledge can apply to every discipline, which it now does, by the way. Uh, it's that he uh, was speaking in a way that was uh, revolutionary and he was good at, at appealing to them. So he, he, he's rhetorically effective. And so he writes about sex. <laughs> we are conscious of defying established power. Our tone of voice shows that we know we are being subversive and we ardently conjure away the present and appeal to the future whose day will be hastened by the contribution we believe we are making. Something that smacks of revolt, of promised freedom, slips easily into this discourse on sexual oppression. So Foucault argues that uh, unlike uh, repressive Victorian morality, which he associates with Christianity, and which I would not, by the way, because I think you can uh, easily demonstrate that Victorian Britain has... Uh, repudiated uh, Orthodox Christianity, and there it is an increasingly smaller number of people that we would identify as such, but still it has the vestiges of it. It just doesn't think uh, or operate in that way. But still, Foucault argues that the way society had talked about sex in the Victorian era created very complex power structures which inform and shape our sexuality in this day. And so he says, <clears throat> we're dealing not so much uh, not nearly so much with a negative mechanism, mechanism of exclusion in our day as with the operation of a subtle network of discourses, special knowledges, pleasures, uh, and, and powers. And so deconstructing those networks. So he's a, he, note, note here, uh, when contemporary queer theorists and those that have been influenced by them speak about... Um, the, the oppression of, of Christianity uh, when their uh, opponents, uh, those who are speaking back to them, let's say myself, will say, well, where are those power levers? Like, where are the Christians in positions of power that are actually imposing their ideology on you? To my mind, there are no such figures that they can even point to. Their understanding is that I'm probably being somewhat disingenuous because they don't mean it uh, so overtly is that they think that it's 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 implicit within the system, and it's and it's particularly lodged in what what they're going to call the binary. Now I'll come back to that, but but again, this very term of of straight and queer and male and female, because I'm in, in, in looking at queer theory, I'm also going to want to move uh, it into the idea of gender identity and so forth. Um, and as we know, gender identity has a multiplicity of meanings, depending on the, uh, the, the speaker. But uh, deconstructing these power discourses is the main focus of queer studies. So really, it's involved in changing language and the structures that are connected with language. So Foucault's studies are shifting the academic focus from uh, what they had been up till that point, which were sociological studies, uh, to do with AIDS or, uh, or, or those sorts of, of human suffering uh, issues to more academic issues, theoretical investigations into language and power. Uh, and with that, it seems to me, that's when political correctness uh, starts to come into uh, the academic world in the 1980s. After Foucault's death, 1984, uh, we can see a growth and, and almost an exponential growth in the, uh, the belief that political correctness uh, was a, uh, a good thing, uh, to put it in the terms of uh, Black Adder. It was a good thing uh, in order to uh, move uh, society onwards. So we had to restructure language because by restructuring language, we were shifting power. Uh, and so on the back of Foucault's work, uh, the, the gay lesbian activists turned from theoretical issues of language uh, into a very real focus on politics and law and, and culture. And so queer was used, originally used as an insult, 
Um, but thereafter, it became a, a form of, of, uh, of pride. That's good for it. We get the, the pride parade. Um, so the identity was there no longer seen as a slur. It was, it was uh, uh, transformed in accordance with uh, uh, Nietzsche's phrase uh, and understanding that uh, the transvaluation of all values, so the, the evaluation that queer was somehow illegitimate would be transvaluated by the community to mean the exact opposite. And, and so the, the pride parades be, begin. Uh, and as time goes by, uh, they not only gain in popularity, um, they become uh, more or less the dominant social group such that politicians are almost uh, compelled uh, to acknowledge the community to not be uh, oppressive. Now, the individuals that are often having politicians who are having this charge thrown at them are usually confused about this, because saying I, I don't, I don't oppress anyone. I have friends who are gay. I, um, I don't uh, use gay slurs, anything like that. But say, but that's not the point. It's not about the overt thing. It's about the subversive structures of language. And so they're arguing that language uh, is an aspect of power. So if you're going to wield power, but you won't use the language, you are effectively perpetuating th the problem. So this is the understanding that um, uh, they operate with uh, as far as I can understand it. <laughs> so um, it, it needs to be seen that there is this opposition, oppositional uh, design and framework, uh, and it's simply being, it's, it's flipping what constitutes the powerful and the, uh, the powerless on its head. So the powerful um, are anybody who's not gay. And that doesn't matter how many, how much power is gained by uh, the queer uh, the LGBTQ community, they still self-designate uh, as powerless as long as their language is not being adhered to. It's just the way their uh, understanding of language operates. And that applies even to um, the notion of gender. Uh, and uh, in the relation of gender, um, Foucault is going to talk about, well, first of all, let me talk about the word gender. For a second here. Uh, the word gender is not a historical category uh, in relation to human nature. Um, if uh, you were, when you were born, uh, and your birth certificates would have, would have specified this until fairly recently, on your birth certificate it would say in English you would have an M or an F beside that's either male or female. And that was your identity and it was an identity that was observable by the doctor uh, it would not no, be your parents, although your parents could have seen the same thing. But uh, originally, the the mother was in the um, was in the operating theater, and and not the father. So the doctor would say, "Well, it's a boy, it's a girl," on the basis of what he observes, or she observes. <laughs> um, but in uh, in accordance with the uh, Foucauldian understanding of what is happening there, is that they are already in the simple observation of what I would see as simply an empirical observation of facts, they are exerting a sort of power. Uh, and it's, it's the power of those who are in the position of the institutional uh, medical establishment over those that they are describing. So again, go back, back to the panopticon observational paradigm. And I think you can see at least the beginnings of, of where uh, that critique would be made, and by the critique, I mean uh, contemporary gender theorists will say that we it, it's an oppression to uh, to designate somebody at birth with a certain uh, characteristic or an identity. Um, and um, they say that that the birth certificate, the identity of the individual ought to remain blank or or at least neutral until such time as the individual, can self-identify and uh, what what gender they have, but note what I said on the birth certificate. There was no mention of gender; it was sex. You were male. You were female, and that was it. There were there were no third categories. Um, 
and increasingly the term gender has come. Um, so backtrack just a sec. Initially, the word gender was used by uh, uh, feminist, feminist theorists to describe the, the cultural aspects of, of, of a male uh, identity and the cultural aspects of a female identity. So for example, a male is a biological XY chromosome, uh, certain features, physical strength, um, masculine and sexual organ, etc. That would be a male and female, again, two X chromosomes, certain sexual features. Uh, and that would be a male, that would be a female. But the social characteristics that are, are conventions that were attributed to that uh, were more malleable and they varied from culture to culture. And the initial uh, feminist theorists objected to these uh, sexual character, uh, or rather the gender characterizations. And they thought there ought to be greater plasticity in gender identity so that women ought to be able to do the same occupations as male. They ought to uh, be able to play professional sports just like men did. They ought to be able to be medical doctors just like men are. They ought to be able to be uh, presidents of the United States, etc., or prime ministers of Canada. Um, and those would be the gender characteristics and they would they ought not to have their uh, their social lives dictated to by the physical characteristic of uh, of sex. And so the distinction was there between sex and gender. Now that holds for quite a time. But if you observe Foucault's dynamic of how power uh, influences uh, what you see and your and and the knowledge that you construct out of that, it morphs, that is the category of gender, to include uh, what we first originally call biological sex. And when I say we, some of us still do term it that way, and I myself do because I think it's a helpful designation. But of course, by holding on to it, uh, those that come from the Foucauldian camp, and the gender identity theorists are going to regard me as being an oppressor, just ipso facto by appealing to a category that determines an identity from the outside, from an observable uh, biological or scientific characteristic, because they're going to they are going to say that Foucault's observations about objectivity are entirely correct, and there is no such thing as as an objective scientific observation that isn't involving a dynamic of power. Uh, so with all that said, um, Foucault will want to argue a freedom from our sexual nature and see it as an emancipatory act. So he sees, he wants liberty in sexual matters. As I say, he's, he himself is a practicing homosexual. He was notoriously promiscuous um, and, and, and he died of AIDS. I think that's a matter of public record. I simply make it as an observation. Uh, but those who are, um, if he were only a, a, a homosexual man and promiscuous, he'd be of no importance, relatively speaking, wouldn't be talking about him. It's his academic work that is of interest uh, and importance and worthy of consideration, as I, says, as I said. And Foucault is not just uh, seeking emancipation from uh, homosexuality and the pejorative way in which it was uh, it was regarded in Marxist circles. This is one of the reasons he wasn't a Marxist early on. He found that the Marxist circles were particularly contemptuous towards uh, homosexuals. And so he was not early on a Marxist. Later on, he did simply because of the political climate in the 19, late 1960s and so forth. But he didn't just want to experience homosexuality and sadomasochism although he was a sadomasochist and a homosexual, he wanted a more radical freedom than that. And so a, a writer that Sandlin cites by the name of John Coffey notes that in a 1983 interview, Foucault made it clear that he endorsed Nietzsche's views on self-creation, or as our contemporaries uh, term it, self-identification. Uh, Sartre and California's New Agers had gone awry, Foucault suggested, because they had introduced the idea of authenticity, implying that one had to be faithful to one's true self 
in fact, there was nothing within or without to which one had to be true. Self-creation had no such limits. It was about aesthetics, not morals. One's only concern should, should be to fashion a self that was, quote, a work of art, unquote. And so uh, Foucault's um, uh, whole project here, and I think it's misunderstood even by his uh, many of his followers, they see it as an ethical project, as a, as a matter of right and wrong. And I think that's simply because uh, we always, as moral beings, conceive our discussions in terms of of, of a of what C.S. Lewis calls the Tao in terms of justice, right or wrong, but that's not how Foucault sees it. He he sees it purely as an aesthetic thing. It's a matter of beauty. It's a transcendent thing, and it transcends the categories even of right and wrong or good and evil. It's more of an artistic enterprise, and therefore emancipation from even the forms of uh, of of a true self, uh, which one can contradict. So freedom and this what this idea of emancipation from the body becomes a key theme in queer writing as well, and so the term uh, the very term coming out uh, is is probably a good description of this. What are, what are you coming out of? You could say the closet, but that that itself is a metaphor. People who are queer now openly. Uh, have long been involved in public life, but it's the point at which they self-identify as queer, as gay, as homosexual, as whatever identity in public that they're said to be coming out. And the coming out then is the very thing that I've just described Foucault uh, uh, to be saying, which is that he, we are creating ourselves at the point at which we come out. And so there is a uh, uh, speaking uh philosophically and, and maybe even theologically here, we're observing something about somebody's relation to him or herself, namely that they are claimed to be authoring their own natures. There's a self-authoring process going on here. I am the master of my own soul uh, is effectively what is saying. And so what uh, queer theorists are promoting, Sandlin notes, and I think he's correct, is that to destroy woman, the, the idea, the concept of woman, does not mean that we aim to destroy lesbianism simultaneously. Um, by the way, this is uh, uh, Monique uh, Wittig. Uh, one, one is not born a woman. This is the uh, essay she writes. Uh, to destroy woman does not mean that we aim to destroy lesbianism simultaneously with the categories of sex because lesbian provides, lesbianism provides for the moment the only social form in which we can live freely. Lesbian is the only concept I know of which is beyond the categories of sex, woman and man. For what makes a woman is a specific social relation to a man, a relation that we've called servitude. Note the dynamic of the master-slave dialectic. A relation that we have called servitude, a relation which implies personal and physical obligation, as well as economic obligation. And in brackets here, forced residence, domestic corvée, conjugal rights, unlimited production of children, etc. A relation which lesbians escape by refusing to become or stay heterosexual. We are escapees from our class in the same way as American runaway slaves were when escaping slavery and becoming free. We seek the destruction of heterosexuality as a social system which is based on the oppression of women by men and which produces the doctrine of the differences between the sexes to justify this oppression, end quote. So it's not just they, uh, uh, there's an, a, a, a sexual action, a preference being stated. It's the doctrine of differences, the naming of differences, the very enunciation that is sought to be eradicated by the queer theorists. And so there's a, there, again, the banner on which or under which they operate is that, that of freedom uh, here. <laughs> and note that the freedom that uh, is gained by the, the movement is, is uh, every law gained for the movement is a loss for a movement that would suggest, or a movement, a, uh, a viewpoint that would suggest that those differences between men and women are actually true uh, and actually uh, 
not only true, but uh, fruitful uh, and, uh, and socially edifying and personally edifying. Um, all of those things are being stated, but again, the master-slave dialectic between the two sexes, the inadequacies, the inequalities, uh, those are promoted most strongly by the movement. So let me uh, um, move on from there now to discuss Judith Butler for a second. I said I was going to come to do, let me do that right now. Uh, Butler was born in 1956, a French uh, Jewish family. Uh, she teaches at, at Berkeley in, in California. I think she's probably still teaching, but not 100% sure about that. She is a leading uh, lesbian uh, feminist, uh, queer theorist, uh, difficult to categorize actually, uh, but all of her uh, discussions are related to the same sorts of issues as uh, Mr. Foucault, uh, forming identity and subjectivity, tracing the processes by which we become subjects when we assume these sexed or gendered or racial identities which are constructed for us within existing power structures. You can see the similarity of language between Foucault's work and and Butler's work. Um, and if you're interested, the, the, the theorists I'm mentioning now can be uh, watched speaking for themselves on YouTube. And I would encourage you to, to do that to get a sense of whether I'm representing fairly or, or misrepresenting the thinkers, but I'm, I'm, I don't think I am. Um, uh, Butler claims from childhood that she dislikes authority, and a lot of it is, uh, again, like, and Foucault likewise, for that matter, is emancipation uh, almost in a psychological way. And so she wants to be liberated from so some sort of oppressive form of uh, liberty. Uh, and so she wants freedom from uh, sex, which, again, sex is now in the queer theory is blurring into the category of gender, which used to relate to the social aspects of a, a, man, a man's or a woman's uh, life and now includes what we used to call the sex. So sex is almost never used in contemporary discourse uh, and almost anywhere, including in, in Christian circles. We, uh, I hear the term gender as an all-inclusive term. This just shows what Sandlin has been arguing and which I would argue, which is that we, uh, the queer theorists, have queered uh, our language such that uh, we are already assuming the lack of legitimacy of the very term uh, male and female and, and father and mother, furthermore, and, and such, uh, for, uh, such forth. And so um, queer theorists don't only want freedom from the limitations of gender, uh, it's only when humanity understands itself as construed not by biological realities, but malleable sociological relations, will homosexuality be able to be enjoyed without homosexual or rather heterosexual oppression. And so the, the, these presupposed biases of uh, towards heterosexuality must be, to use their phrase, queered sufficiently that we can simply get rid of them. And so uh, not that long ago, um, the uh, Kathleen Wynne government here in Ontario got rid of the terms mother and father, father rather, uh, in relation to um, the, uh, the family unit. And this is the influence of queer theory. Why did they do that? Because they regard the terms as fundamentally oppressive and therefore needing to be got rid of. And it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. Uh, you're being liberated uh, because you are, whether you recognize it or not, uh, by using such terms, ipso facto and oppressor. So uh, with specific ref respect to the uh, uh, naming of babies, um, Butler says this, that the gendered body is performative. Oh, no, hold on for a sec. Um, let me backtrack a bit. She talks about a baby being named in, in these terms. She says, consider the, med the medical interpolation. So the interpolation here is the, uh, the, the doctor getting between the child and the parent and the, the power dynamic there. Consider the medical interpolation which the sonogram notwithstanding shifts an infant from an it to a she or a he. And in that naming, 
the child is girled, the girl is girled, brought into the domain of language and kinship through the interpolation of a gender. But, but she says that girling of the girl does not end there. On the contrary, that founding interpolation is reiterated by various authorities and throughout various intervals of time to reinforce or contest this naturalized effort. The naming is at once the setting of a boundary and also the repeated inculcation of a norm. So the claim here is that uh, what is happening here is a normativity uh, and authoritarian um, oppressive naming process is going on that violates the integrity of the person that has been named. Uh, and underlying all this, again, I think we need to see um, at root is a as an enlightenment understanding of the human person, namely as an autonomous uh, organism, as I argued in my own uh, book, um, Romanticism, Hermeneutics and the Crisis of the Human Sciences. Um, the enlightenment understanding of a human being is no longer a human person. It is an autonomous organism and that's it. And, and it's self defining and the processes uh, of, a, of a biological organism are always one of becoming and never of being per se, because an organism is always in interaction with the environment. And the, the interactions never stop. It's a constant process. Uh, there isn't a fixed identity per se. Um, now, I, I don't agree with Butler, but I'm just, uh, it's, it's, it's helpful to note her language here. And so uh, another figure uh, writing on Butler by the name of uh, Sali, um, S-A-L-I-H, sums up her views as this, gender does not happen once and for all when we're born, but is a sequence of repeated acts that harden into the appearance of something that's been there all along. And so, it, so a girl is not born a girl, but she is girled, to use her coinage, at or before birth on the basis of whether she possesses a penis or a vagina. And they say this is an arbitrary distinction. Note the word arbitrary uh, is rooted in the Latin word arbitrio, will. It's the will to power of the medical professional or anyone looking at a sonogram. I guess the parents are also exerting their will to dominance simply by uh, observing the penis or the vagina as a, an important aspect of the, the child's identity. But they argue this is an arbitrary distinction. And Butler will argue that sexed body parts are invested with significance. So it would follow uh, that infants could just as well be differentiated from each other on the basis of other parts. The size of their earlobes, the color of their eyes, the flexibility of their tongues. Far from being neutral, the perception and description of the body, it's a girl, etc., is an interpolative performative statement and the language that seems merely to describe the body actually constitutes it. So Butler is not refuting the existence of matter, but she insists that matter can have no status outside a discourse that is always constitutive, always interpolative, always performative. And here again, all of the writers that we I'm discussing here, uh, Butler and uh, Foucault, and many of the 1960s literary theorists are leaning hard on Martin Heidegger's view of language as the house of being. And that there's no, there, there's no, to use Derrida's phrase, there's no odd the text. There's nothing outside the text. Language itself brings things into being. Now, I don't think it, they, Heidegger means what they mean him to mean or think that he means there, but nonetheless, uh, Heidegger is the core language thinker that lies uh, behind this alongside Saussure, because again, Saussure uses the structuralist binary understanding of language as words relating to other words and words not relating to things. Go back to my, August, my discussion of how Augustine approaches this topic differently in his work, De Doctrina Christiana. Um, for me, I'm with uh, most critics on this, at least uh, that once existed, am I saying the idea that sexual difference is socially constructive beggars belief. Um, and and when, when they're talking about gender in this way, uh, we're saying, but there is a sex there. But again, I've, I think I've already highlighted why 
uh, there's a belief that the very understanding of sexuality, because it's observed with the eye, because it can be observed by authorities, needs to be eradicated as a form of oppression and the terminology that comes with that likewise. So what we're moving towards then, and this is what explains contemporary gender identities, is the only valid permissible form of human gender identity is one that is going to exist at odds with our sexually observable identity. Only then will it be considered legitimate because only then will it, will it demonstrate the, the progressive emancipation from matter, which characterizes the Gnostic thought of all of these individuals. And all we are lacking then is a sort of a view of a sufficiently robust view of imagination. So I think I've more or less uh, described uh, what um, Butler thinks about that. Um, I can say that that the ideas of of Butler and Foucault have uh, influenced the entirety of the human sciences now. Uh, and in particular, I would say even in theology, and maybe perhaps even particularly in the discipline of theology, there's a lot of queering going on in terms of uh, the terminology that is being uh, argued as necessity in order for us to be enlightened, rational, um, humane uh, academics. Um, and um, uh, I'll leave it at that, but I want to talk about uh, finally, I want to consider this, uh, I said I wanted to look at it, the big picture, I've, I've described it to some degree there, I've talked about the, the, the element of liberation that comes from coming out, uh, the idea that uh, even the terminology of sex, uh, because it can be observable scientifically, in fact it is from the very outset, is observed by the establishment, is ipso facto an oppressive power assertion that in order to be freed from that and to make social progress, we need to resist and overturn and hence get rid of the categories of um, even male and female. We haven't got there yet, but we have got father and mother gone from uh, social uh, family law in Ontario. Uh, and I think in other places in the world now as well, but Ontario is in the forefront. But I also said I wanted to critique this and offer some, um, not just to present it um, as um, well as I could, but also to think about it with, with um, eyes that will look at it a little differently. And I think uh, helpfully that you'll be able to tell me whether you think so as well. Um, and this is, uh, I wanna start off, I'm gonna read a series of five texts and try and link them together uh, because I think that what they're addressing is something that is of, of a great deal of interest to me uh, and we're going to build on in the final three or so lectures of the class, which is in the post-1960s literary theorist theories, we move from post-modernism towards post-humanism. I said that um, a, a few classes ago when we talked about post-modernism, that post-modernism roughly falls between 1968 and 1998. Uh, Foucault is emerging and he dies in 1984 and it's really upon his death that he becomes profoundly influential, although I think the influence is there before in sociological circles, but it expands outside that to be throughout the humanities and so, such that he becomes the most important uh, writer in, in even in history and in English and in, even in philosophy uh, and theology. Uh, and even in, the, in the, the natural sciences these days, we cannot find any realm where uh, queer theorists are not making their mark on the academy. Uh, but stepping back from this a little bit, I want to look at what it means to be a human being uh, and uh, what uh, some of the dynamics of moving from a post-modern to a post-human um, categorization means, because I think that that's what's going on here. We're having a new sort of humanity being defined for us uh, under the uh, umbrella or under the auspices of a, a uh, emancipation. Um, and, and yet I question whether the emancipation is actually taking place. In trying to free the slave from the master, are we in fact doing the exact opposite? Are we in fact enslaving people to a master or a master form of 
uh, dialogue that is effectively dehumanizing. I happen to think it is. But here is the first reading. So this is from C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Uh, it is the uh, book four, and I believe it's chapter two of that. No, it's chapter one of the book. And he's talking about uh, human beings being made in the image of God. Um, uh, from Genesis 1, uh, 26 and 27. Um, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Uh, that's, that's what the Genesis text says. Uh, note that at the very outset, uh, God creates humanity, both male and female. Um, and the two together constitute humanity. And both the male and the female uh, bear the, Im the image of God. So there's no sense, at least from uh, core, the first word on human nature in, in the Bible, and it's repeated elsewhere, there's no sense that a, a woman has a lesser humanity than that of the man. On the other hand, there's also no sense, uh, there's a decided sense, rather, that she is, um, her sexual nature is a uh, an identification that cannot be eradicated without loss of her humanity and furthermore it will go on to say uh, in genesis 128 that they're to be fruitful and multiply and fill and subdue the earth and so the two are presented not just as uh, two binary opposites they're presented as a marital pair uh, as the first family and they're told to have children and there's a, a sense of fruitfulness and flourishing that comes from that, and not only from uh, propagation uh, or begetting, but also from the fact that they will then relate to the earth in a certain way, and they're to bring it under the dominion of God, which is regarded as a good thing. It's part of God's command. But back to the idea of gender, uh, sorry, human identity, uh, because f following the fall, which takes place in Genesis 3, uh, we don't have the same human nature. We do bear the Imago Dei, but it has been corrupted by sin. It's a fallen nature. Uh, and C.S. Lewis observes, what man in his natural condition has not got is spiritual life, the higher and different sort of life that exists in God. We use the same word life for both. But if you thought that both must therefore be the same sort of thing, that would be like thinking that the greatness of space and the greatness of God were the same sort of greatness. In reality, the difference between biological life and spiritual life is so important that I'm going to give them two distinct names. The biological sort, which comes to us through nature, that is through begetting, um, and which, like everything else in nature, is always tending to run down and decay so that it can only be formed up by incessant subsidies from nature in the form of air, water, food, etc., is, he, he calls it bios. Whereas the spiritual life, which, in, which is in God from all eternity and which made the whole natural universe, is zoe. And so they relate in some ways. They are connected, uh, male and female, uh, are in some ways, because we use the word life for the two of them, and yet there is a distinctiveness there. Because the, the Zoe is the life that we get from God when we uh, confess that his son uh, is our Lord and we receive new life. Uh, we're born again, to use scriptural language. Um, and, and that life, nonetheless, is a, is, a, is a sexual life. It's still transmuted. We still have children. We still live and die, and yet spiritual life is passed on and spiritual life is given to both male and females but they don't cease being male and female so galatians 3 27 that in christ there's no male or female is not talking about the loss of their sexual nature it's talking about their inclusion in the body of christ fully because he also includes the uh, jew or greek or the uh, slave or free or the greek or, or scythian i believe so it's about inclusion as full membership in the body. It's not talking about the loss of those distinctions. Uh, Paul cannot be seen to be a queer theorist. Uh, so that's the first uh, comment I wanted to make, and I thought it was quite helpful uh, insofar as it, it notices something that um, 
has changed rather in in our discussion of sexual identity and it is really related to our whole relationship to uh, the human body and this is uh, was to some degree identified by Lewis in his own language but it's it's better represented here by Oliver Don Oliver O'Donovan who's a an Anglican theologian and and ethicist and so at the outset of this where he's this is a book about bioethics as much as anything by the way uh, he notes that when the fathers of the Church Council of Nicaea declared in words familiar to every Christian who recites their creed that the only Son of God, the Father, was begotten, not made, they intended to make a simple point, the Son was of one being with the Father. He was God, just as God the Father was God. And to emphasize the point, they used an analogy based upon our twofold human experience of forming things other than ourselves. That which we beget is like ourselves. I shall use the word beget, O'Donovan says, as the ancients did, to speak of the whole human activity of procreation. And not in the modern way, speaking especially the male side of the activity. Our offspring are human beings who share with us one common human nature, one common human experience, and one common human destiny. We do not determine what our offspring is, except by ourselves being that very thing which our offspring is to become. Just so, the Father said, the eternal Son of God, who was not made, was of the Father's being, not his will, not arbitrio. It was, he was not made. He wasn't, it wasn't a decision as such, uh, or let alone will. But that which we make, Obadonovan says, is unlike ourselves. So, so whether it's made of matter like a wooden table or of words like a lecture or of sounds like a symphony or of colors and shapes like a picture or of images like an idea, it is the product of our own free determination of our will, in other words. So Obadonovan identifies three things here. It's implicit in this, and I think it's really important uh, to identify here. He makes a distinction between begetting, procreation, and reproduction. This is in the language that follows here. And he notices how the old language in English we used to speak of begetting, and in fact in Scripture, in the uh, King James version of Scripture, the language of, is of begetting. Uh, it sounds a little antiquated in our ears, and in general it tends to be captured by uh, those that want to hold to the um, something of the original sense of the text as uh, to procreate, um, although it's, it sounds a little odd but it has the sense at least of passing on one's nature to another. Uh, but Adonifan notices a, a, dis a distinction here when we use that word procreation. But there's a further alienation from this idea of something that is like ourselves and is of ourselves that is passed on in the term uh, reproduction, because reproduction is something that we can do to objects. And so he, he notes here very subtly, and I think quite powerfully, that even speaking of reproductive rights, and in terms of the whole discourse surrounding human bioethics and human uh, sexuality and human nature of these things as matters of reproduction, is already using a mechanical metaphor for and fundamentally denaturing what is distinct about human nature, namely its it's uh, the fact that it bears the Imago Dei and furthermore that we relate to human beings differently than we relate to things. We can't reproduce a human. A human beings are unique. Uh, they have an individual characteristic and not just the social herd characteristic. Uh, these are really important uh, features. But he also notices uh, that he says, for all that human beings begotten of other human beings are, they are at the same time made by God. And that's the distinction between uh, the Son of God, who is begotten by God, and human beings who beget other human beings and yet at the same time are made by God. And that's presented in the Genesis 2 text where Adam is formed out of the ground and out of clay and so forth, that idea of being made. Um, uh, and that's the original state of human uh, beings. So that is, to my mind, really interesting. But uh, O'Donovan's observation here, which I think applies to queer theory and gender theory for that matter, 
is that it is, uh, it's really important to note, and he cites two texts here, two books that I think are worth looking further into if you're interested in the subject, uh, George Grant's uh, Technology and Empire and Jacques Ellul's The Technological Society. I would pull them up right now, but uh, if my books are all packed up because of the uh, virus and all the chaos there and I can't find them. But he says, our society and our culture uh, does not think about things that it does um, um, we, we've been uh, conformed to think that this culture is technological through and through. So it's not technological because it's instruments of making are extraordinarily sophisticated, although they are. But because it thinks of everything, it does as a form of instrumental making. Everything is seen in instrumental terms. So politics, he says, which should surely be the most non-instrumental of activities is talked of as making a better world. Love is, quote, building a successful relationship. He says there's no place for simply doing, for acting anymore. The fate of a society which sees wherever it looks nothing but the products of the human will is that it fails when it does see some aspect of human activity, which is not a matter of construction, namely begetting, to reckon, it fails to recognize the significance of what it sees and to think about it appropriately. So the very language of reproduction, the very language of constructing our own identity gets rid of the idea of the giftedness of life of the fundamental goodness of having received something and not determining it uh, even with our own wills. That idea of the giftedness of life is, is lacking in this. And he says, this blindness in the realm of thought is at the heart of what it is to be a technological culture. I'm going to read on a little bit more because I just think this is so profound. Nevertheless, though thought comes first, there are implications in the realm of practice too. When uh, such a society is incapable of acknowledging the inappropriateness of technology, technical intervention in certain types of activity when every activity is understood as making then every situation into which we act is seen as raw material waiting to have something made out of it if there is no category of in thought for an action which is not artifactual it's not making something then there is no restraint in action which can preserve phenomena which are not artificial so there's no restraint on our, um, our power over our own nature, over our own bodies. There's no restraint on it. And so the idea which uh, gender identity theorists and Hegel, or Hegel, Foucault himself calls emancipation could just as easily by this understanding be seen as uh, an absolute crushing of the very thing that it seeks to emancipate. And although the charge might not be true in some cases, there's no dividing line that will determine whether something is an oppressive act or a liberating act. And I believe that the line is regularly crossed because of that fact. And, and uh, O'Donovan notes that this imperils not only or even primarily the environment as we patronizingly describe the world of things which are not human, it imperils what it is to be human for it deprives human existence itself of certain spontaneities of being and doing, spontaneities which depend upon the reality of a world which we have not made or imagined, but which simply confronts us to evoke our love, fear, and worship. Human life then, last word, becomes mechanized because we cannot comprehend what it means that some activity is natural. And so the human sciences ultimately swallow up the humanities and with it, humanity along with that. Now, this, if you're interested in this, I think that this book by Hannah Arendt, The Human Condition, is profound on this subject. Um, I have read it several times myself, and I wrote on it in uh, the second chapter of my own book, Romanticism, Hermeneutics, and the Crisis of the Human Sciences. Um, and she is going to argue there exactly the position that O'Donovan has asserted there about human nature and the becoming of it. And she sees it as, an, as a consequence of the uh, cogito uh, from Descartes. So when he says, I think I am, 
he doesn't actually establish the fact that he's being, he merely establishes the fact that he's thinking and therefore he's becoming as a result of his thinking. And that will tie in with what we are seeing here in queer theory about our thinking giving rise to our identity and therefore we have to manufacture it to solidify its, um, its uh, reality in the world. And so we are, we are commodifying human nature and mechanizing it in the terms of reproduction present it. And so to use another thinker now, what we have here is uh, the antithesis to what uh, uh, I said O'Donovan observed about the church fathers, that the, that the son was begotten of the father. And, and in John 1, it says that the word was made flesh and uh, dwelt among us. That's a reference to the incarnation. With modern language theories, it's the antithesis. It's the flesh made word. Um, so, lang so language now determines even our very physical bodies. And what follows is the surgical techniques that seek to make what our imaginations believe is, an, is, is a liberating uh, experience. Whether it is so, um, I rather doubt. But the, the point uh, that I'm making is there no longer any terms that we can use publicly to discuss this to suggest that something might not be a good thing or a bad thing. And therefore, we have just as much reason to say that it is a bad thing as we do to th say it's a good thing. And there's no criteria of determining this either. It's simply an, a, a will to power. And I think that is exactly what we're seeing here. I'm going to conclude with a quotation from C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man. And this is from the third chapter in which he's speaking of that very thing, the abolition of man. And he writes, in order to understand fully what man's power over nature and therefore the power of some men over other men really means, we must picture the race extended in time from the date of its emergence to that of its extinction. Each generation exercises power over its successors, and each, insofar as it modifies the environment bequeathed to it and rebels against tradition, resists and limits the power of its predecessors, because that's what we mean by asserting power over human nature. We're limiting the influence of previous generations and on our generations. But each time we do that, um, we're not only... Uh, limiting the power of the past and therefore of God's ordination over human nature, by the way, because I think that's what secretly lies behind this. It also modifies the picture which is sometimes painted of a progressive emancipation from tradition and a progressive control of natural processes, resulting in a continual increase of human power. He says, in reality, of course, if any one age really attains by eugenics and scientific education, the power to make its descendants what it pleases. All men who live after it are the patients of that power. Note, it's not just against the past, it's against the future. They, that is future generations, are weaker, not stronger. For though we may have put wonderful machines in their hands, we have preordained how they are to use them. And if, as is almost certain, the age which had thus attained maximum power over posterity were also the age most emancipated from tradition, it would be engaged in reducing the power of its predecessors almost as drastically as that of its successors. So it's all the will to power for here and now and to, ha to hell with the past or with the future. And we must also remember, Lewis says, that quite apart from this, the later a generation comes, the nearer it lives to that date at which the species becomes extinct. The less power it will have in the forward direction because its subjects will be so few. So if we control reproduction and we control our, our genetic or our, our carbon foot, footprint by limiting the number of human beings on the earth, we're limiting the power of future generations just simply by number alone. And there is therefore no question of a power vested in the race as a whole. We can't talk about the, the empowerment of humanity. What we're talking about is the empowerment of our generation against the past and the future. And so the, the last men, far from being the heirs of power, will be of all men most subject to the dead hand of the great planners and conditioners and will themselves exercise least 
power upon the future. This, to my mind, is what is going on in our generation. There is a great deal of power it asserted through the human sciences uh, upon the humanities being exerted politically, but in particular in the war realm of discourse. Um, as, an, as an academic, as a Christian academic, as somebody who believes in justice, as somebody who cares about human rights, I think the, the, the dialogue, the ground of dialogue about this needs to be opened up without the slurs of you, you're being dehumanizing by not using the terms of identification that I choose for myself. That's as much of an assertion of a will to power as anything else. And once again, it not only uh, it diminishes the power of the past, I believe it diminishes the power of the future for the sake of the power of the present, which is diminished to a, a, a very small elite group of individuals. And I think it needs to be revisited rather urgently. But that is what I have to say about this. Next time I will talk about the cyborg feminism uh, and see where it develops from this.